on to this now. COVID-19 cases in South Africa is nearing the 145,000 mark. Now, could technology help measure social distancing and manage the spread? Mobex Group Chairperson Vianney Chahana believes that the ICT sector could assist in flattening the curve and manage the spread patterns using large-scale telco data. And uh, he joins us now to elaborate further on this matter. Mr. Chahana, thank you very much for your time. I want to start off with what you have said in uh, a statement or an article I saw, and you say that uh, the use of technology and artificial intelligence have the possibility to help governments better manage the spread, uh, in particular the patterns of COVID-19 in an open economy. Translate that into simple English for me. Uh, morning, morning, Tolly, and morning to the viewers. I think, uh, firstly, we know that that uh, one of the key uh, drivers of spread in terms of COVID-19 is, uh, is, is proximity, which means people being close to each other. That's why the biggest uh, interventions around uh, exercising hygiene, or wash your hands, avoid, uh, avoid uh, contact, which is the social distancing aspect. Now, when you look at the, the cases that are coming out consistently, the most important thing is to understand the spread patterns. Now, telco data has both uh, demographic information as well as location intelligence, which means that if wherever I go, I go with my mobile phone, it's known that I've been in a particular place uh, last week on Wednesday. When I test positive today, then the system is able to go back to history and say, well, Vuyana may have been positive last week, but still the results were not out. Where was he last week? Who was he close to across all networks? This is when you start to see people who may have been exposed to a, a Vuyana who may have been uh, positive already, but did not know because the results were not yet out. Now, understanding the, the spread patterns, understanding the patterns of exposure will help government begin to tailor make intervention around testing isolation as well as really making sure that you can lock down specific areas yeah technology in terms of mobility you, if you use telco data it's a good proxy for population database because there's high penetration of mobile phones in south africa and in the continent yeah. now if you use that, you have a, a sense of spread pattern. It's one thing to say one area is a, is a hot spot, but actually people don't stay there, they move. So how do you make sure that the movements you restrict and you're intelligently able to see what those movement patterns are? So that's what the technology can do combined with big data and artificial intelligence. It can assist to understand spread patterns and proactively warn people who may have been exposed. And that's how you could actually help governments better manage COVID spread. Now, the crucial, that's what we element, the crucial element of what you're saying, Mr. Jahana, will then involve people giving out their personal information and oftentimes the complaint about uh, technology and in particular reference to personal information is the sharing of that information either erroneously or someone uh, basically uh, coming across it and wanting to use it for their own uh, ends how safe can this problem be because I'm actually just reminded as I ask you this question of the Minister of Communications who at the time of uh, the lockdown was actually uh, announcing that uh, our cell phones were now going to be used to try and trace exactly where our last steps would have been. I think Tolly, we, we're facing a global pandemic. It's, it's, a, it's a global crisis. I think uh, if I look at what happens in other countries where they have not managed this thing very well it's more catastrophic i would want to be warned if i'm exposed so which means that somebody can look at my data and tell me Vuyana, you have been exposed therefore take precautions so that you don't you don't actually spread the virus to other people mm -hmm. but there are global data privacy protocols and rules that are applied globally south africa has a an act which is called poppy protection of personal information act <clears throat> poppy act all those can can be used to protect the the use of that data there will be only two conditions through which which somebody could be allowed to look at my at my number either i've tested positive because the 
the molecular testing data came back saying positive, then there's justification for that person for me to be tracked. Secondly, if I happen to be exposed because I was close to you, Goli, who happened to test positive. That's the second justification through which somebody would have been allowed to look at my number. Outside that, there's no basis to look at anybody's number. So you can develop protocols that are very clear, traceable, auditable, that enables us to manage the spread. Yeah. Uh, final question. Look at Singapore and Japan, countries that have been successful in doing this. They have applied large scale type of data with AI and big data. They seem to be the ones who have been, who have been manage, able to manage this thing better without yeah. locking down the economy extremely so. I think these are kind of trade-offs we have to make. Yeah. But the trade-offs doesn't mean that you should be vulnerable. There are clear protocols, rules, you can look at my numbers, auditable, traceable, and there are only two conditions in which you could look at my number. Either I've tested positive, therefore you're tracing me, or I've been exposed. You're helping me uh, to be aware and not to expose people. Final Outside that, too. there's no question. Final question to you, and I'm sorry to, to cut in there, uh, but uh, uh, time is against me. I, I can't not take advantage of um, you having been the CEO at uh, SAA. You're well aware of the business rescue process that's underway right now, and it's no secret that that process has to some degree been mismanaged. In your view, who is at fault for mismanaging this entire process? Well, Kale, I wouldn't put it as uh, being mismanaged. I, I think that uh, uh, there's been a great deal of progress between uh, DPE in my reading from a distance and all the forces. The creation of uh, what is called the, the LCF from a distance is a, was a good instrument to make sure, make sure you facilitate conversation around what the settlement plan would be like. You would realize that uh, in a business rescue process, there's a workers' committee. Those workers' committee tend to be tacti tactical instruments that are very mechanistic and there could be a lot of brinkmanship. But the establishment of a separate forum that is looking at brokering a deal across all stakeholders, I think it was a, it was a good, good, good move. I, I, I think that uh, both uh, DPE and Labor should find one another. It's, it's a simple exercise as far as I'm concerned. The airline is where, is where it is today. And you have to develop a plan that says, in the future, in the next three years, it's going to look like this. It can't employ all 4,700 today, but we think that when it performs a peak, it will take, say, 3,000 or 2,900, the numbers I see on the media. So if you agree on that, then it's a case of what's your ramp up plan? How do you build up the plan to get there? And uh, those who cannot be accommodated by a successful airline post, uh, post restructuring, we accept that those people may be retrenched and how you deal with packages for them. So I think the LCF was a good move to, to broker a deal. I think that both all parties should go back to the LCF in my view because it's a good instrument. Uh, the, L the workers committee hardly achieves much for everyone. Uh, your thoughts this morning. He is uh, the chairperson of the Mobex Group.